Uh, good evening, friends. Welcome to this Tuesday evening academic sessions by the Department of Critical Care Medicine and other specialities by Yasoda Group of Hospitals. We try to bring some interesting topics which are of interest to all our clinicians. We make some interesting debates. Uh, we uh, bring some controversies to uh, discuss about. And today, we have an, again one more topic uh, to enlighten uh, our interactions. Uh, that is updates in neutropenic sepsis. So both the neutropenic fever and the sepsis being defined in a different ways, but putting them across was a new phenomenon which we see in this last uh, couple of decades or so. So to bring this discussion, we have Dr. K. C. Misra, who is heading the Department of Critical Care Medicine in Yasoda Hospital, Samaje Guda. He will take us through uh, the review of uh, the updates in uh, neutropenic fever and syndromes and sepsis. And to give his expert view, we have none other than Dr. Nicholas. Um, so uh, he has been a seasoned uh, um, uh, medical oncologist from Yasoda Hospital, Sommaji uh, So he will take us through the, uh, the expert opinions in that after the review of Dr. Misra. So over to you, Dr. Misra. Thank you, Dr. Venkat, and thank you for your kind words. So, so Dr. Nikhil can, uh, in between, add to uh, the points which, as we discussed. Uh, we welcome you, Dr. Nikhil, onto the uh, this program. It is an honor and uh, it's a privilege to have you on board, Dr. Nikhil. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, before Dr. Mishra can start, uh, both Dr. Mishra and Dr. Venkat have been close friends and both are, you know, I would say, quite uh, pillars as far as the critical care is concerned, as far as Yashoda group of hospitals is concerned. And they are quite instrumental in uh, doing quite a phenomenal work, especially what I know from last few years, especially from the COVID times, especially when Dr. Venkat had joined us. And he is also doing quite, quite a phenomenal job in terms of getting this academic uh, feast uh, at a quite a regular basis. Uh, I quite often join his meetings, uh, which I believe are quite important, especially for students. And I hope he keeps it up. And uh, of course, Dr. Mishra is uh, with whom I work very closely. He's the one who bails us out most of the times when we are in trouble. So I look forward to Dr. Mishra's presentation. And of course, we'll have some interactive discussion at the end of the today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, see, like uh, today's topic, as usual, all our topics are very interesting. The name itself is interesting. You see, neutropenic sepsis. I've gone through a lot of literature and uh, most of us might have gone through. Basic, uh, if you see, the most common thing what you can see is neutropenic fever, not like per se neutropenic sepsis. You can say neutropenic sepsis is a severe form of neutropenic fever or fever in neutropenia. If you see the data, uh, uh, like whatever the guidelines and all has come, and uh, maybe in 2010, IDSA people have sent, uh, has uh, given the first guideline, then European Society of Clinical Oncology. The latest one is with American Society of Clinical Oncology, which got uh, released in 2019 with IDSA. I think that is the latest guideline what we have. ICCM, that is Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine, also has some guidelines when it comes to treating patients of febrile neutropenia or severe neutropenic patients. So what I am going to do today is I am going to touch upon the basic things in, in all through guidelines and some practical points we'll discuss, maybe in between my presentation also. And as usual, after the presentation, we'll take all the questions. To start with, let's see... Uh, Just a second, there is some technical glitch. It is not getting. Yes. So febrile neutropenia is nothing but a medical emergency. You have to take it like any other emergency, what we see in medical medicine, like your heart attack or stroke, because these patients are very, very sick. They may not give you enough time. And I will show many slides on that, why it is very important that we need to take this febrile neutropenia patient in an emergency. What we are going to discuss today, there are many causes of neutropenia, but we'll try to 
uh, fix into the cases, mostly the patients who are on some form of malignancy, let it be a solid organ or hematological malignancy or transplant people on chemo. These are the basic what we are going to discuss today. Now, we are not going to go into all the possible causes of neutropenia and all. So, coming to the background, if you see neutrophils play a very important role when it comes to innate immunity. Innate immunity, the first immunity what takes care of any organisms which is coming to our body, that is the direct it will attack the organism, do the oxygenization and killing the bacteria or virus or fungus. Because of there is uh, uh, decrease your neutrophil counts, these patients are at high risk of developing these infections caused by bacteria and fungus, fungal infections. Many cytotoxic chemotherapy agent which usually acts on the myeloproliferative cells of the bone marrow, apart from the tumor cells, which are supposed to be the targets, resulting in neutropenia. And one interesting concept, which has been now coming up in a bigger way, that is this uh, concept came from ESCO, that is American Society of Clinical Oncology. These agents also damage rapidly dividing cells. Particular concern is our gut mucosa. These people can develop severe mucositis starting from the mouth throughout the gut they can have severe damage to your gut lining epithelium, which will increase the chances of translocation of gut bacteria. Patients with neutropenia usually have very subtle or delayed signs of, uh, and symptoms localized to infection because of their inability to mount a proper inflammatory response. So this, in fact, this fe fever is maybe the only sign in this population when it comes to infection, when they have neutropenia. Febrile neutropenia, that is the reason, requires our urgent and thorough evaluation and treatment because time is here is very, very important. If you uh, are not able to diagnose properly or treat them aggressively, you will end up in multiple organ dysfunction and afterwards you can see we can't save the patient. Coming to the neutropenia and chemotherapy, so there are enough data to say that the severity of neutropenia is directly proportional to the intensity of chemotherapy, but different chemo agents have different forms of uh, or severity of neutropenia. Some chemo agents can cause severe neutropenia or we, where we can expect that their neutropenic chances are very high, maybe more than 20%. There are group of people, group of chemo where you can have a neutropenia of 10 to 20 or less than 10%. Neutropenia usually occurs one week after delivery of the cytotoxic chemotherapy, but it is not always, but usually happens after a week of a initial cytotoxic chemo. Patients uh, on chemo for solid tumors usually they have neutropenia, which is more of a brief period, usually stays for less than seven days. And out of these patients, five to 30% of people can have febrile neutropenia and usually the highest rate seen in the first cycle of treatment. When it comes to hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, receiving chemo, they are for hematological malignancy, they have prolonged neutropenia. They can have prolonged neutropenia, which lasts maybe 14 days or more. And most of these people, people almost 80% of them at least have one or multiple episode of febrile neutropenia. Coming to few of the definitions, what, what do you mean by fever in a patient who is neutropenic? What, how to define neutropenia and what do you mean by febrile neutropenia? Fever in these cases or as per our uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine by US, what they have given is fever in these patients when they have a temperature of more than 101 degree or more than 100.4 degree, which is in two occasions, no, in a period of one hour. Neutropenia, when we say it to be severe neutropenia, absolute neutrophil count has to be less than 500, or we are expecting the neutrophil count to go below 500 in the next 48 hours. This is IDSA guideline, which was given in 2010. Febrile neutropenia, if you add these two things, if somebody is having severe neutropenia with a neutrophil count of less than 500, and having a uh, fever of more than 101, one instance or more than 100.4 in, in the last one hour. There are few more definitions. Profound neutropenia, when we say absolute neutrophil count of less than 100. Prolonged neutropenia, when neutropenia persists for more than seven days. There is an interesting terminology called functional neutropenia. When maybe the neutrophil numbers are not very low, but these people have qualitative defect in the neutrophils. So these neutrophils, because of your chemo agents and all, they have don't have the proper function what they can do as a neutrophil. So their impaired phagocytosis and killing the pathogens will be there. So even if the numbers are normal, they don't act as a normal neutrophil. 
coming to our topic that is neutropenic sepsis we can take it like a neutropenic sepsis is nothing but a severe form or se the the max maximum you can say the most severe form of neutropenic fever if you see there is no uh, specific uh, like uh, any um, criteria or any guideline is given how to define a neutropenic sepsis the same sepsis guideline what we use as per our surviving sepsis guideline can be applied when it comes to neutropenic patients also. So, so far, what most of the time, the SOFA score, what is widely used when it comes to patients of sepsis may not hold good when it comes to neutropenic patients who are on chemotherapy because chemo-related uh, lot of uh, complications which can affect the brain. The patient may have sub, uh, sub optimal sensory and platelets most of the time drop because of chemo, which is one of the important factors when it comes to SOFA score to diagnose a patient in sepsis. His liver function and uh, renal functions may alter when a patient is on chemotherapy. These are the basic issues when it comes to a patient on chemo and neutropenia. And there to diagnose them to have a sepsis or not to have a sepsis becomes difficult. But still, if you see the surviving sepsis guideline, what they've defined as sepsis is sepsis is a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response. Septic shock when the blood pressure is less than 65 or lactates are more than 2. If you combine both, whenever their oxygen neutrophil count is less than 500, with this guideline of sepsis, if both are combined, we say it to be neutropenic sepsis. Dr. Misra, just to uh, give a uh, add on points by Dr. Nick, uh, Dr. Nikhil. And Dr. Nikhil, we have been um, seeing these cases uh, for the last maybe a decade or more from your experience. So this has been always a challenge to define or making some clinical criteria, some scoring systems in these group of patients. Uh, it, it happens to me that I wrote a chapter on this uh, same topic to which Dr. Misra was mentioning to me just in the beginning of this discussion. So what is your take? Uh, we do know that the infections are common in these patients. We do see the sepsis in these patients, but there will be so many overlap of uh, uh, dysfunction of other organs due to chemo agents, due to other things. What will be your take on this? So <clears throat> quite an important question here. Now, what happens is this neutropenia is not one, I would say, disease or it's, it, one can say it's a broad spectrum. It ranges from absolutely asymptomatic patients where patient walks in with the low numbers to the extent that the patient comes with directly in a shock-like state. So, and at the same time, when we discuss about various guidelines, now there are guidelines like MACC guidelines, there are some scores are there, with ISNE scores are there. Now, <clears throat> at times they are really challenging to apply in a day-to-day -day life because every uh, score has its own, you know, uh, I would say some positivity as well as there are certain restrictions also over here. And especially in the background of various organ dysfunction, as Dr. Mishra just now mentioned about uh, low uh, platelet count, which can be a factor. One slide, Mr. On slide before this. Yeah, so where the platelet count can be a confounding factor, where it can it it can also happen because of itself due to chemotherapy. So there are itself there are challenges. Having said that, we have to stick to the guidelines what have been given to us, although they are not perfect ones, what are we have with us and we normally try and follow and we have based uh, or rather formulated our algorithms based on those guidelines and I am sure we are going to take some more questions on that. I think Dr. Mishra would also have some slides related to that. Yeah, yeah, he has. Next slide, Mishra. So what is your take uh, on this slide, Mishra? Uh, the next one, which we... Next slide. Uh, hey, no. We combine both uh, sepsis definition on one side and neutropenic definition on the other side. We felt if the patients who had a neutropenia with these, we consider them a neutropenic uh, septic patients. So what is your take on this? In fact, we combine two definitions. One side ID, yeah. the other side surviving sepsis. Uh, I think uh, this is a direct copy from your chapter, which you have written in the book, which is uh, going, to, uh, which has been recently released. So basically, if you see, I have gone through a lot of literature. Actually, there is no clear cut definition when it comes to neutropenic sepsis. I think this is the only definition or at least some idea by which we can define when it comes to a sepsis in a neutropenic patients. So see, like if there is a neutropenia, the patient may be stable also when the problem comes when the patient is very stable. 
when the patient is stable if the patient is really having an infection or all the symptoms or all the numbers whatever we are getting in the laboratory test they are all because of chemo or there is an infection going on becomes difficult to diagnose if somebody is presenting sick let's see a septic patient most of the time you can diagnose because first of all they will be looking toxic they may have organ dysfunction you can localize some source of infection maybe a lung maybe a uh, skin and soft tissue maybe some um, uh, line related sepsis or a urinary tract infection something you can at least uh, touch upon like this is the most probable source and now the patient is looking toxic maybe organ dysfunctions are there maybe bp is borderline in those cases things are little easier to say that the patient having neutropenia the fever is related to infection but it is becomes very difficult when it comes to a fever without uh, like significant derangement where basically they are not in sepsis they may have or may not have infection becomes very difficult to diagnose that is what i after going through all those thing and seeing cases also i believe in that and those people if you don't diagnose them early and treat them aggressively they may land up in sepsis and once they land up in sepsis with multiple organ dis dysfunction and all treating them becomes a very tricky and difficult situation and a lot of patients uh, like they lost their life because the mortality is very high when it comes to this patient having some gram negative infection it may range up to 70% also okay mr we'll go to no, your, your presentation so coming to the pathogenesis i think uh, i touched up on all those things neutropenia predisposes patient to different forms of infections because of their significant uh, issues with both humoral and cell mediated immunity they may have neutropenia or there may be some quantitative or qualitative uh, problem with the neutrophils whatever they have the main reason nowadays which is coming up as i have told earlier is disruption of the mucosal barriers because of the cytotoxic chemotherapy that causes translocation of gut bacteria most of the time we get uh, like our gram negative bacilli sometimes we get gram positive or fungal infections are common when the patients are having severe mucositis where we can see the oral cavity which is involved the same thing can happen with the whole of your gi tract which can cause translocation of gut bacteria causing severe forms of infections common so, pathogens mishra can i make a comment over here especially for students <clears throat> so what essentially happens is when you talk about any cytotoxic or myeloablative or myelosuppressive chemotherapy the basic principle is to kill the dividing cells as you right now just now mentioned about mucosa so there are certain specific cells of the body which are dividing and that is one of the reasons why we get very specific side effects so one typical uh, you know you see a lot of patients with the alopecia loss of hair because you know that they are in a various phases of anagen and telogen so you get hair loss similarly you get lot of mucosal damage especially in the form of oral mucosa like uh, uh, and third is of course our myeloblast or you know uh, precursors of neutrophils so these are all typically i would say dividing cells like platelets and all that rapidly dividing cells maybe yeah, so wherever you get rapidly dividing cells you are going to get some kind of adverse effect and here exactly when you get this kind of uh, pressure on the mucosa at the one one side at the same time you also have got neutropenia due to uh, uh, arrest of the neutrophils the neutrophil uh, eventual uh, multiplication you get this combination where on one side the mucosal barriers are breached and that leads to the at the same time the immunity is at its rock bottom and together typically leads to this kind of phenomena what we are discussing that is neutropenic sepsis yeah uh, you see like uh, this you know, severe neutropenic patient can have very different forms of infection apart from the common pathogens what we see on on and off in our regular icu patient they can have even rare or less common organism if you coming to the bacterial pathogens gram positive organisms and both gram negative organisms are common in gram positive pons and staph are very common even nowadays enterococcus and that to vancomycin resistant and resistant enterococcus uh, numbers are increasing drastically when it comes to neutropenic patients but still in india i believe gram negative pathogens are still scores high as the number of organisms growing in different forms of culture mainly the yeah. our e coli klebsiella enterobacteriaceae family and pseudomonas there are data whenever there is a pseudomonas they have very high mortality when it comes to neutropenic sepsis if you see there is one slide what i have just showing on the left side this is a very old slide which was published long back in 1999 and that what they have shown is from the early part of 70s 
to 90s from gram positive infection sorry gram negative infection which was more common in 95 around the gram positive infections are more common these are the data were from the western uh, western countries when it comes to india we are still struggling mostly with the gram negative infections and most of the time they are resistant to our beta lactams and commonly this gram negative are from the enterobacteriaceae and pseudomonas group and some gram positive which are like staph and cons are more common than enterobacter enterobacter uh, sorry uh, enterococcus and all so in india we are still struggling and that too more with the gram negative infection and in neutropenia patients having gram negative infection they have much higher mortality compared to gram positive infections fungal infections usually fungal infection in a febrile neutropenia doesn't we don't see fungal infection in the early part of the infection usually we see fungal infection in the later after 7 to 10 days of profound neutropenia or prolonged neutropenia and these people are prone to develop candida and aspergillus because candida can translocate from the gut itself and aspergillus can come from your uh, because contaminated air and all from where you can have aspergillus spores which is a ubiquitous organism you can have aspergillus from that invasive mycomycosis fusarium and other endemic fungi are very rare when it comes to but still it can be possible when it comes to neutropenic patients because of their very low immunity viral infections so if you uh, see uh, mishra can i make a comment here about fungus please yeah <clears throat> so uh, again you no know, as a medical oncologist we end up treating lot of solid tumors but also we also have a share of you know liquid tumors or what you can talk about is leukemias so typically this fungus is more often seen with the leukemias rather than the solid tumors it's not that we haven't seen in solid tumors but the the possibilities are quite low and when it happens with the solid tumors it more often to do with the catheter related infections for for uh, as you rightly mentioned that the patients who have got prolonged neutropenia secondly the patients who are receive prolonged dose of antibiotics thirdly patients who have got uh, these uh, leukemias or bone marrow transplant patients these are very classic patients where one can uh, see these these particular fungal infections uh, quite common at times they can be catastrophic one has to be really you know vigilant when you really want to you know to pick up these in infections uh, we do come across aspergillus and candidiasis mucormycosis is surprisingly it's uh, quite low in uh, this group of patients again but if the patient has got underlying some kind of diabetes uncontrolled sugars the same parameters what may apply to other set of patients so but yes uh, you know especially when the numbers start crossing this day 5 day 7 of neutropenia and one has to be really you know vigilant about this and uh, that these are the times where you start getting this uh, fungal infections more often than not you rightly told sir i think the most because why we are not getting much in solid tumors says the neutropenia usually lasts less than 7 days most of the time but i am not the expert to say that but in this uh, leukemia aml post transplant these people have prolonged and profound neutropenia in the mean time as you told catheter related uh, infections causing candidiasis is more common actually for that also there is a data what they have told is initially what we were thinking about catheter related that may have come from the gut itself so if somebody is having severe mucositis which can trans uh, we can uh, translate that thing to even gi mucosa which is involved and translocation of candida uh, candida because the translocation of gut bacteria is more common than uh, candida caused by catheter related like indwelling uh, central lines and all coming to the viral infections herpes simplex varicella zoster viruses are common in patients who are sero positive and reactivation occurs almost in two third of the patients and mostly who are requiring chemotherapy for aml or hematopoietic stem cell transplant we should not Uh, ignore CMB. CMB reactivation chances are also very, very high when it comes to severe neutropenia and profound neutropenia patient. Basically, who are underwent hematopoietic stem cell transplantation or chemo for AML, where you will have prolonged neutrophil uh, counts on the lower side. Apart from that, the common organisms uh, when it comes to community acquired respiratory viruses like your influenza, adeno, and metanemo viruses are also very common. They be much commoner than your herpes simplex and versus varicella zoster viruses when it comes to pneumonia. in a neutropenic patients again like risk assessment of these cases is a paramount important thing 
our topic like neutropenic sepsis, we believe that the, the high risk or the most high risk patient when it comes to neutropenia and uh, uh, febrile neutropenia. But there are patients if uh, which having low risk, not like septic patient, febrile neutropenia patients. For them, the risk stratification is very, very important to know which kind of antibiotic will suffice, oral or IV, where we need to treat the patient. The patient can be treated as outpatient or inpatient and duration of antibiotic. There are different scores which are being utilized to stratify these patients as per the risk. The most commonly used one is Multinational Association for Supportive Care in Cancer score, that is MASCC. The other one is Clinical Index and Stable Febrile Neutropenia score. I think the MASCC, whichever uh, guideline I have seen, they have uh, told about MASCC only. And if you see, this is the MASC score. Here, the higher the score is better, the outcome will be. The total score will come out to be 26. Anything more than 21, we believe the patient is a low risk patient. The chances of having severe uh, infections or uh, bad outcome will, will be less. Whereas whenever the score is less than 21, we believe these patients are high risk patients and need to be treated aggressively and with uh, proper time bound. So high risk patients coming to the high risk patients, whenever we believe MSC score of less than 21, there is a profound uh, neutropenia, profound neutropenia and which we believe uh, may stay for a prolonged period of that is more than seven days with comorbid illness, like if the patient is hemodynamic unstable, oral or gastrointestinal or mucositis, which interfere with swallowing, they may have diarrhea, even CD diarrhea is very common in this kind of patients, neurologic or mental status changes, intravascular catheter infections, especially tunnel catheters, because those are difficult in catheter to treat, new pulmonary infiltrates, hypoxemia, or underlying chronic lung, lung disease patients. Evidence of hepatic insufficiency or renal, renal insufficiency. These are the patients where uh, which scores in high risk. If you see any patient of neutropenia and we believe they're in sepsis, they will come in high risk patients only. They will never be in low risk patients because they have multiple organ dysfunction to start with. Whereas low risk patient, when we believe the mass MASCC score of more than 21, and uh, we believe the neutropenia may not stay for uh, more than seven days. There is no active comorbidities or there is no significant organ dysfunctions. How we will manage these cases? So these are the difficult patients where every minute and every hour is important. So I just covered few of the important things. Like if you see the most important part in initial evaluation will be history and clinical examination. We need to make sure that, as I told earlier, if patient is not having significant uh, symptoms, it becomes very difficult to know that all the symptoms are because of infection or because of the chemotherapeutic agent itself. So it is important to have a proper detailed history, organ specific symptoms we need to see where maybe the infection is there in the lung, urinary tract infection, or it is because of your catheters. This is very, very important for how many days the patient is having all the symptoms, when he has received that chemo last. So as per that, we can have an idea when the neutrophil counts may improve in those cases. The patient is on any prophylactic antibiotic also make uh, uh, like that will decide on what kind of antibiotic the patient may need to be started with because most of the patients who are having uh, receiving chemotherapy, they will, they will be on some form of antibiotic before. Previous microbiological data, a patient has grown some form of infections before, some organism he has grown. In that case, we may need to think about what antibiotic will be suitable for that case. We can just start a, uh, like when somebody has grown some multi-organ um, MDR bug and we can't start with a BLBL in those cases. In those cases, we have to go for a pyrobacinum or maybe sometime higher antibiotics. Examination skin and mucous membrane is very, very important. And that's not be overlooked because skin infections and mucous membrane mucositis and other forms are very very common. But uh, even in uh, but in the IDSA guideline, they told not to do for per rectal examination. Maybe we will be introducing more infection or what I am not sure. But they have specifically mentioned not to go with per rectal examination. Any uh, comment on that, sir, Nikhil sir? So yes. So this is something which is probably taught to us in the first month of our training. I would. I mean, I can take you back to almost 15 years ago that no per rectal examination, no per rectal temperature recording of the patient, uh, if the, even if the patient is having pain and all that, it is very, it's, that's, that's the area where you know, there is, if there is slightest of the mucosal bridge due to the investigation, due to examination, 
uh, patients has always a high risk of getting this translocation or trans migration of the bacteria. And that is something what we don't want in a profoundly neutropenic patient. So it is especially important for the students to understand that avoid any per rectal examination as much as possible. And also need to also need to sensitize your colleagues also many a times when the patient comes like neutropenia and all of a sudden patient is having perianal pain and somebody does a per rectal examination, which can be quite uh, <clears throat> at times can be uh, can worsen the situation of the patient, especially when the patient gets some mucosal breach. So one should avoid that. That's the basic understanding. And I think you have covered most of the points apart from that. As we mentioned, always the ABC remains important for all the patients, the way we look at all the patients, uh, like any like any other emergency. But typically always keep on a keep a watch out, keep a watch on any area or any focus of infection, as you rightly mentioned about skin, soft tissue, sinuses, uh, oral mucosa, catheter, chest abdomen, perirectal area, uh, there are, I mean, each and every area need to be seen very carefully. And these are, so clinical examination, nothing can surpass clinical examination when it comes to evaluation of the patient. Nicely told, sir. So coming to the investigation, the routine investigation as usual for most of the sick patients, they will be requiring your common blood uh, pictures, RFT, LFT, coagulation screen need to be done. CRP sometimes we do in these cases. Blood cultures, again, is very important. At least minimum two set of blood cultures need to be sent in these cases. One, if somebody is having a, uh, some central catheter in place, it has been mentioned that you need to send cultures from each and every lumen, not only from one lumen, if the patient is having the uh, central line is having three lumen, you need to send cultures from all three lumens if you are suspecting infection. Then. And if there is no central uh, central line or central catheter in those cases, two cultures need to be sent from two when you separate when you If you suspect urinary tract infection in these cases, we need to send urine analysis and urine cultures tool. If there is signs of uh, like abdomen, most probable source of infection, the patient is having diarrhea and abdominal pain, you need to send urine analysis culture, including maybe clostridium difficile also. If there is skin lesions, you need to aspirate, do a biopsy or swab also, but swab nowadays we are not uh, taking as a good uh, source of um, like a uh, microbiological source, chest radiograph. Sometimes we may need to, if let's see patient is having profound and prolonged neutropenia and fever is persisting, in those cases we have to be more aggressive like in our cases where we believe the patient is in sepsis and neutropenia, in those cases, maybe we have to go more aggressive going for an HRCT chest where X-ray most half of the time can miss a pneumonia. So better to go with HR, high resolution CT scan early than late, maybe a CT abdomen is there is abdominal signs and symptoms. Even BAL, in these cases, if you believe pneumonia is a possibility to go early, and do a uh, bronco uh, like bronchoalveolar lavage in the cases if it permits a patient is stable enough to go with a ball better to go with a ball early than late when it comes to at least <coughs> risk high risk patients having severe neutropenia and sepsis biomarkers this is a controversial topic again if you see crp crp is like uh, been used and more so in the pediatric patients crp is non specific uh, maybe CRP is, is very high, we think, in terms of a bacterial infection more than viral. And it may be positive or high in cases of many hematological conditions like myeloma. Even the patient is receiving chemo, also the CRP might be high. Procalcitonin maybe holds maybe more promising compared to CRP, which is most extensively studied. Elevated procalcitonin is shown to be associated with bacteremia and more so with gram-negative. Higher procalcitonin com uh, predicts complications because of neutropenic fever, whereas if the neutropin uh, procalcitonin are decreasing trend, most probably we can believe that patient is in the improving trend. There is pent pentraxin 3, which is not widely used, but uh, can have false positive in rheumatoid arthritis, vasculitis, but higher values corresponds to uh, increased mortality. Again, one more important biomarker when it comes to beta D glucan and galactomannan, even surviving sepsis guideline also suggests to do beta D glucan and galactomannan in a selective patients where we think there is a possibility of fungal infection, more so with candida and uh, aspergillus. Maybe beta D glucan is uh, less specific compared to galactomannan when it comes to aspergillus, but can be done if it's significantly high, it has a good sensitivity specificity 
with clinical correlation. If clinically we believe that patient may have a fungal infection and neutropenia is persisting for a prolonged time and patient is not responding to initial antibiotic, in those cases, these biomarkers can help in deciding that this patient may have a fungal infection and starting antifungal treatment. Other studies like X-ray chest and CT scan, as I've told, non-responders are persistent fever more than 72 hours. Better to go with a uh, HRCT chest. And we cannot rely on uh, X-ray chest alone because half of the time it can miss a pneumonia. When there is a the pain, abdomen, diarrhea and all, when there is a severe neutropenia, these patients can have neutropenic colitis. Even Clostridium difficile is very common in this kind of patients. So it is better go aggressive, do a CT abdomen with contrast. And this patient may require uh, like uh, C. difficile and uh, stool for routine examination and cultures need to be sent aggressively and early. Even rapid molecular tests like multiplex PCRs, which can be done uh, within no time, we can get a result within four to six hours of doing that or sending that test, holds good in these cases, which can give you a fairly good idea which kind of infection it might be. Mostly for the respiratory infections we send, maybe respiratory pneumonia panel. It is not widely available for other form of infection, but respiratory infection, pneumonia, we are believing, maybe rapid molecular test, multiplex PCRs holds good. Coming to the treatment, so there is no great change when it comes to treatment from what I can see from 2010 IDSA guideline to the 2019, uh, your American Society of Clinical Oncology guideline. But there are few things which has been added when it comes to ISCCM. They have some guideline when it comes to neutropenic sepsis. If you see the ESCO or American Society of Clinical Oncology 2019 guideline, what they have suggested is, first thing what you need to see if somebody is having fever with neutropenia. I am not talking specifically on neutropenic sepsis patient, but I am trying to tell up the like overall picture whenever there is a fever and neutropenia. If first thing what we need to do is the risk assessment. If the patient is comes into the low risk category, you send blood cultures and uh, symptom specific investigation and all. And first dose, try to give an IV antibiotic. Observe those patients for some few hours in the clinic. If the patient has never received uh, quinolones, you can discharge them on oral antibiotics like amoxicillin, clavulinic acid, ciprofloxacin, and moxifloxacin or something. If the patient is on ciprofloxacin or some chloroquinolone prophylaxis, then this patient require IV antibiotic. They have suggested to go with cefepime. Whereas in high-risk patients, they have to be admitted and uh, treated in inpatient and there we need to send all important investigation required and the antibiotic what has been suggested as per the IDS or ESCO guideline is cefepime, piperacillin, tazobactam and meropenem. And it has to be given as early as possible. They have suggested within one hour of the patient contact with the hospital. You can't delay because delaying antibiotic uh, introduction or giving the antibiotic increases mortality significantly high in these cases particularly. Coming to gram positive to cover, uh, I'm not discussing again, I'm telling like this, in the high risk patient who are hemodynamically unstable, we believe there is a sepsis, patient is having pneumonia or patient is having catheter related infection, skin and soft tissue infection, there you have to, at front you have to start a uh, gram positive to cover. Like a patient having neutropenic sepsis, you have to give gram negative plus gram positive to cover at the front. In other cases where the patient is stable enough, there is no skin and soft tissue infection, you are not suspecting any central line related infections and all, you can still wait to, uh, to wait uh, on starting a gram positive to cover. So, uh, Mishra, I'll just make one quick comment over here. Uh, the gram positive coverage is quite important, especially when you identify certain pointers, especially for students again that whenever a patient has a hypotension, hypotension is like, you know, we know that we have something called a staphylococcal toxic shock syndrome. So that is quite an important entity. And these are the patients. Secondly, patients who have got extreme form of mucositis, grade three mucositis, what one can say. In addition, as you are rightly mentioned, patients, those who have got kind of a catheter and especially patients who have got some kind of perineal pain or perianal in inflammation, inflammatory <clears throat> signs or symptoms. These are the typical patients one can seriously consider adding MRSA cover or gram positive cover upfront rather than waiting for another 24 or 48 hours. So these are the typically what we follow in our day-to-day -day practice. Any of these pointers, any skin or soft tissue infection, because these are the areas where the colorization happens the most. 
so these are the areas one one should watch out for and one should really uh, think about use of uh, you know uh, gram positive cover in these patients Yeah, then uh, what they have told, like uh, as for the guideline, if somebody is having persistent fever, even after your empiric antibiotic for beyond 72 hours in IDSA, they are told to be more than four days. The patient is high risk patient, like in our patient with neutropenia and sepsis. You, if there is ongoing fever, you have to continue IV antibiotic considering, consider different forms of imaging. You have to ask for maybe an ID or a clinical microbiologist. If documented infection, you get it, then the antibiotic needs to be modified accordingly. If not, discontinue vancomycin if initially started. I don't know why, but it has been mentioned. If there is no ongoing fever, review the cultures. There is uh, see the workup and all. Discontinue vancomycin again, they have told. And if you get a uh, documented infection, it, uh, change your antibiotic accordingly. If not, if patient is stable enough, just continue the antibiotic what you have started empirically. This is what has been told in high-risk groups. In low-risk groups, if ongoing fever is there, then you need to hospitalize the patient and start off IV antibiotic. If there is no ongoing fever clinically stable, you can continue with the oral antibiotic and uh, follow up them every day or every second day. Whereas in Indian scenario, things are little different. In Indian scenario, as per the ICCM guideline, what they have seen is in India, most of your infections, I have told earlier, are gram-negative infections, and most of them are resistant to beta lactams. So yet front only, we may need to start thinking of carbapenem, then starting a beta-beta lactam like a piperacillin and tazobactam, cepipime, because most of the time it may be resistant. To start with the carbapenem is makes sense when it comes to Indian scenario, even that, that is what ICCM guideline also suggests. Maybe imipenem, silastatin, or meropenem is a better choice when it comes to a carbapenem. In patient having carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, or patients having lymphoma leukemia, or they have documented beta lactam, beta lactam is inhibitor uh, organism grown uh, previously, or patient uh, uh, already receiving a beta, beta, uh, beta lactam, beta lactam is inhibitor. In those cases, better to add a polymix in B or cholestin at front with your meropenem or imipenem. That makes sense in Indian scenario where we are getting too many cases of extended drug resistant organism when it comes to gram negative bacillus. Neutropenic patients where persistent fever and uh, is there for more than three days or four to seven days as per the IDSA, we need to think about adding antifungal. In patients who are underwent hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, having severe mucositis with diarrhea, prolonged anticipated neutropenia, in those cases, what ICCM suggested is to start with echinocandin, mostly a cascofungin, enclofungin, or mycofungin. And actually, in IDSA, what they have suggested is voriconazole versus amphotericin B. But in Indian scenario, what they have told is to be echinocandins. Any point on that, sir, Nikhil, sir? Uh so again, uh, I mean, every guideline will have their own set of uh, rules, I would say. And especially, I just would like to take you back to previous slide and then I, I'll come to this particular question that uh, the previous one. <clears throat> yeah. So again, uh, it's probably may not be a right, uh, I would say, take home to tell everyone that imipenem silastatin should be first line of treatment. Again, it all depends on what kind of patients we are looking at, what kind of infection we are looking at. Was there any previous history of any isolation of any bacteria in the past? Are we really suspecting something like, you know, a more, uh, more of a stronger bacteria in, in all scenarios? So it's not that always that you have to start a imipenem and silastatin or meropenem upfront. But these are all, I would say, individual decisions what a doctor normally takes, depending upon the entire previous comorbid conditions, the degree of sepsis, the shock, and other things. So in patients who are slightly lower risk and who still can be, uh, not all the low risk, again, we can manage on the outpatient basis, but there are those typically in between patients where these patients can still be safely managed with third generation semi-synthetic penicillins like piperacillin, tazobactam, or cephalosporins like, you know, uh, cefepime and all that. Uh, patients who have got GI symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms, a metronidazole remains an appropriate option which has been given by certain guidelines. So all in all, <clears throat> uh, on one side, we are equally concerned about the patient's outcome. At the same time, we are also concerned about the drug resistance. 
So one has to strike a right balance when you really choose your antibiotic. It is again very important for, uh, I would say, uh, oncologist, hematologist, a critical care specialist, and as well as physicians to strike a dialogue with the microbiology department, try and understand <clears throat> what kind of infections this our particular hospital is looking at and try and understand the spectrum, try and understand the resistance patterns. Always it's important to have uh, at times when it's really required in, uh, to involve the ID experts, maybe at the early phase of their patient's treatment, that makes a lot of sense so that you no know, one can be more judicious, especially when we talk about the antibiotic selection. So not all our patients also go on imipenem and silastatin and meropenem in the first line, but there are patients who are come with a proper septic shock or profound neutropenia less than 500, hypertension and looking sick. Patient faces tells you a lot of things. So these are subtle things what one should be always be looking at and then decide on these uh, certain uh, antibiotics. Yeah, coming, yeah. To the next, coming to the next uh, question, I think you asked about yeah. antifungal. Uh, Dr. Nikhil, I think uh, you made a right point that uh, the uh, guidelines are always a broad guidances to give uh, based on uh, generalized phenomenon across a country or across a, some uh, region or zone. Uh, but what actually has been seen across the last couple of decades, if you look at the ideas and recent changes uh, made, uh, are key. There is a stiff rise in resistance in this gram negative bacteremia. So that's the reason which made a lot of changes in the empiric choices. We do understand a stable patient, low risk patient, outpatient based, uh, or a borderline case is fair enough. As you rightly pointed out, it depends on your local antibiogram, your institutional antibiogram, or your bacterial pattern and resistance pattern, and your departmental resistance pattern. Where from your patients comes? What is their backdrop? What is the organisms you grow in your patient base when they, it comes to your wards or your oncology units? So this will guide you. And what has been seen when you come across this gram-negative bacteria, the common bacteria which we come across is Enterobacteria, which is E. coli in many of urinary tract or a bacteremia or genetic urinary tract. And then you have Klebsiella and some of those respiratories are Acinetobacters. And when these organisms grew, many of them are ESBLs. And if you remember Dr. Nikhil, the earlier guidelines all were talking about Ceftagidium alone in combination with uh, your vancomycin. If you remember in all, all our school days, we used to read about. The changes they made now, as you said, a BLBLI, which you are talking about, Piperacillin, Tazobactam, or your one of these Cabipenums, these are all alternatives which are given in considering with those changes in the resistance mechanism where these patients may not give you a time. But yes, it is always you need to look at all this context at a time, not a one single guideline or a single pattern. But there is a backdrop why these guidelines has been talking about considering these all antimicrobials because of the pattern which we are seeing in the countries or region or your zone or your patient base. And including which Misra made a point of adding a polymyxin or a cholestin. If your patient is already received a carbapenem in the recent past in the admissions, and if a patient is already being on BLBLI in the early period and patient deteriorating, so what we have seen these cases where a patient is already on a carbapenem, we de de nowadays grow most of our gram-negative bacteria, which are carbapenem resistance. So once you actually get your report, you can always de-escalate. And we are talking about sicker group of patient than probably a stable patient, which you mentioned. So, so I'll just make a quick point over here. Now, uh, try and understand not all patients are, I mean, when you come across a patient, uh, neutropenic patients or neutropenic sepsis, it doesn't mean that they are, have to be you no know, uh, significantly sick. That doesn't happen all the time. Yes. At the, at the same time, what essentially happens is a patient who only has taken a therapy, let's say in the hospital, these are the patients what we typically are talking about. about. Now, many of these patients are not actually exposed to any of the bacteria. So their, their bacterial flora is still very much sensitive. So upfront, if the patient is not very sick looking, then I think it still makes a lot of sense. But a patient who already had got a couple of bouts of infection in the past, let's say a couple of cycles, and you know for sure that this patient is going to colonize more of those, you know, uh, uh, more of a resistant set of bacteria. These are the patient, the threshold <clears throat> to start the same antibiotics is much less 
as compared to the patients who are like you know who are more of I would say naive patients. So again, it's more of you know uh, yes. always we uh, there is always a you know bit of a bargain which happens, which patient what antibiotic which which is low which is more. Uh, whether we should directly go for uh, you know carbapenems i mean we we do start a lot of patients on carbapenems but there is some kind of always a thought process why certain things happen in a certain manner yes and can i ask one question dr nikhil actually maybe uh, we see only the patients who are sick enough to come to the icu where most of the time we are starting carbapenem gram positive and maybe antifungal at the front itself but the question is, do you treat patients as outpatient when they have severe neutropenia and that to a oral antibiotic? How frequently you do that? So I I would say that I <clears throat> I don't treat much out, uh, outpatient uh, uh, neutropenic fever. I would say neutropenic sepsis probably is no no way we can. No way you can. Anymore. That's what they are but, the sick patients. But, but neutropenic fever on case to case basis, where you believe that this patient probably has only one or two days of neutropenia, absolutely young guy stable, all organs are fine, no comorbid conditions, hemodynamically doing well. There are patients where we, but uh, we tell them to take the treatment, some oral antibiotics like, you know, amino, uh, this uh, amoxicillin clavulanolite uh, plus uh, leoflox or ciprofloxacin. This is a very common set of antibiotics what we use for low-risk patients. <clears throat> but again, it's not a rule. I would say if I treat 100 neutropenias, this will be, uh, this would form less than 5 or 10% of patients. But they have to be ultra stable all along, and they should also be near the vicinity of the hospital all along, whenever it, such things happen. And they also need to be sensitized. What are the things they should be looking at, especially if any new symptoms arise, so that the patient can still come to emergency in no time and okay. treatment can be escalated. So very interesting point made. You said five to ten percent of your all neutropenic fever patient will be on oral antimicrobial and probably an outpatient based therapy. So the rest all will be inpatient uh, under your guidance, not intensive in the intensive care. So intensive care will be again, what is the percentage in intensive so care? Correct. So, so, um, so what probably, I know in the intensive care, what the kind of patients, especially from, let's say I'm talking about more of a medical oncology, uh, we rarely land up uh, our patients in the critical care. It's quite uncommon. But if it happens, it's uh, you know it's a quite a challenge. We know that these are the patients who are going to struggle. Having said that, majority of patients, our 80-85% of patients are managed uh, quite easily at uh, in our uh, uh, you know uh, wards. IV wards, IV wards. Yes, and we normally able we are able to manage most of the times because as uh, Dr. Mishra had rightly mentioned. We know that they are slightly better patients. It's not that we are doing something magical to this patient. It's just that their neutropenic phase is quite small and they are slightly stable patients. Their bone marrow is a functioning marrow. Uh, vis -a -vis when we talk about a leukemia or a transplant patient, where bone marrow itself is under, I mean, there are hardly any uh, precursors. Very so these are the, there are the challenge here. There are precursors already under so stress. What will be your choice of antimicrobial in IP patient, not in septic shock or sepsis in requiring so, ice? What will be your choice? So, correct. So again, as I mentioned, I will only have look for certain pointers for gram positive, which I already mentioned. Yes. But the, the more important drug remains more of a gram negative cover. And when you talk about gram negative cover, we more mainly go for semi synthetic penicillins like piperacillin, tazobactam. Perfectly. Okay. And Perfect all, I maybe, think maybe, that, that makes the sense. Yes. That's piperacillin, tazobactam, which will have both uh, enterococci cover, gram positive, gram negative, and anaerobic cover. Anaerobic. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yes. Makes sense. So, those, uh, the, that again is a part of all the guidelines, uh, if you agree with me, with Misra. So, they have taken out ceftazidim, but they still have cefepime on board. They still have piperacillin tazobactam on board. They talk about carbapenem. So all these are always on board, depending on your uh, you know, journal or your local antibiogram, you can select. Misra will go forward. Yeah. Uh, antifungal actually. Oh, so this is the this second slide. question. That, that was the second question, I think. Yeah. Right. I was asking about an echinocandine role. See, uh, many of our patients uh, will be on either a fluconazole prophylaxis in the initial phase or later on maybe an empiric uh, fluconazole. Uh, but I think this is again, uh, he's asking about echinocandine suggested by ISCCM. The same answer remains, uh, Misra, ki these are 
the ISCCM is talking about critical care consultants and critical care fraternity. So these are again intensive care patients, sicker group of patients, and that's why I think the Casper Fungin or Echina Candin came into the board. So we deal uh, with uh, Echina Candin to start with. Again, wait for the cultures. If negative, drop it or de-escalate it. You see the other uh, uh, guidelines. If you are suspecting molds also, they prefer more of posoconazole over echinocandine, which covers both candida and aspergillus when there is a doubt. Or maybe the lung or something else, which is the source possible of aspergillus is still there. Anyway, if uh, candidiasis is what we are thinking, echinocandine in a septic or uh, sick patient will be the drug of choice. There is no doubt in it. Coming to the next slide. Gancyclovir prophylaxis has been suggested in patients who had some uh, seropositive uh, before the starting of the chemotherapy or bone marrow transplant and all. And patients specifically who are not responding to antibacterial, antibacterial having some lung involvement and uh, in the same time they have some gut involvement having diarrhea and all. Actually, IDCA. I think, uh, Dr. Dr. Nikhil, they are talking about uh, CMB uh, enterocolitis, which has been a phenomenon in this group of uh, immunocompromised host. How commonly we come across? So, uh, you know, as a medical oncologist, we don't see much CMB, but at the same time, I am sure my uh, hematology colleagues, like Dr. Ganesh and Dr. Madhav, who uh, deal a lot with those transplant patients or severe propondy. Uh, neutropenic patients for a very long time, more in a transplant setting, more in a allogenic transplant setting, the CMV re reactivation, especially after all these immunosuppressions, lymphopenic treatment, the CMV reactivations are quite common. Again, <clears throat> typically these patients do uh, present with a bit of a, you know, cytopenia. Itself, the infection-related cytopenia is one of the uh, findings with these patients. At times, when you start on gancyclovir, again, it can cause further neutropenia yes. known with these patients. One has to be vigilant, one has to have a very low, low threshold to send a test for a quantitative, you know, CMV, PCR, look for the viral load. And uh, IgGs don't help in this regard, especially CMV, IgGs, IgM, maybe plus minus, but more to do with the viral loads. Viral load. And, and you take your, uh, you uh, take your right decision. But these are typically seen in the patients who are like, you know, post-transplant patients who get this activation more often. I rarely see in patients who are like a solid tumors. We rarely see that. I mean, we do send few patients when the patients are not responding, but I hardly re remember in the recent time any patients coming positive with the CMV reactivation because it's a it's not neutropenia which causes it's a more of a lymphopenia. So again, we know that viruses are more activated when there is a lymphopenic environment where bacteria are more notorious in the neutropenic environment. Slight different spectrum over here. Empirical uh, anti-nemocystis aerobicic prophylaxis and treatment, when it comes to basically the patient who has underwent hematopoietic stem cell transplantation or on chemo for T cell depleting agent and prolonged uh, steroid treatment, these people should re uh, receive prophylaxis with uh, usually trimethoprim with sulfamethoxazole empirically, especially in the cases where they didn't receive PCP prophylaxis. As we know, if somebody is on PCP prophylaxis, almost rules out to have a PCP infection because the chances of having a PCP infection on a, for a patient who is on PCP prophylaxis is very, very low. So these are the few like uh, prophylactic antibiotic which has been suggested by our ESCO guideline and IDSA guideline. What they told is if the patient is having protracted and long-term neutropenia or profound neutropenia where the neutrophil counts are less than 100, they have suggested to start with ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin as a prophylaxis. What they found out is there is good amount of trials which has suggested if you start prophylactic and uh, antibiotic in these cases, their uh, mortality benefit is significant. Even after they have uh, febrile neutropenia, chances are not coming down that much, but still they have a mortality benefit. In cases of uh, protracted neutropenia and significant stomatitis and uh, mucositis, those patients better to start with candida prophylaxis. Usually, fluconazole is the drug of choice here, is a prophylactic agent. 
in patients with aml or uh, your mds treated with myeloablative regimens in these cases posoconazole because the mole chances are uh, uh, your aspergillus chances are very high in the context of graft graft versus host disease in these cases better to go with posoconazole as a prophylaxis in patients having chemotherapy with purine analogs i am not very good in these things maybe dr nikhil can tell or on steroids with a significant dose for a long period there the pcb chances is more than 3.5% or 4% in those cases ppp prophylaxis make more sense herpes simplex zero positive patients undergoing gametophytic stem cell transplant and leukemia induction chemo and all in these cases better to give them with acyclovir treatment with nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors are makes sense in cases having hepatitis b reactivation chances are high coming to g csf this is again a controversial thing we can give in three conditions one is primary prophylaxis for the patient where we start chemo and we believe they can develop neutropenia uh, in more than 20% of cases if the chances of developing neutropenia is less than 10% you can uh, like withhold or don't give you know, granulocytes uh, this stimulating factors in them but when it comes to 10 to 20% these are the group of patient we need to decide as per the patient uh, risk benefit ratio secondary prophylaxis usually we give gcsf after giving the chemo within first or second day of starting of the chemotherapy second day secondary prophylaxis when a patient had uh, severe neutropenia in the first cycle of chemotherapy in the initiation of second cycle of chemotherapy we start of uh, uh, cis stimulating uh, stimulating factors early this is a secondary prophylaxis there is a third category where definitive during the neutropenic sepsis this is a questionable thing in idsa they suggest against using uh, prophylaxis with gccf when it comes to a patient having severe neutropenia and we are suspecting sepsis or infection in them what do you suggest sir nikhil sir in this kind of patient specifically neutropenic sepsis patients so uh, the the standard practice across the world is to use gccf in this setting because these are the patients who are i would say sitting on a time bomb all the time so uh, you know the the faster the recovery of the neutrophil count the good the better likelihood of this patient to survive and come out of the entire septic episode so we do recommend we do use uh, gcsf uh, in fact i totally agree with when you mentioned about the primary prophylaxis yes so more than 20% we we are slightly more generous about use of gcsf in the current setting uh, but there are patients where the where the chemotherapy protocols mentioned that okay there is only a 4% chance of getting neutropenia the problem is that that particular patient it becomes 100% and that becomes a challenge so a good discussion with the patient a first cycle the vigilance is much more for most of the patients uh, gcsa was quite expensive in the past now it has come quite you know much handy and much cheaper now so uh, many times the patient come from a distance and these are really logistic issues where a patient might take at least 3 to 4 hours to reach hospital so there are many other logistic uh, reasons why the gcsf is used but these are what recommendation these are what guidelines this is something what we all should know at the same time one should utilize this gcsf uh, as per you know specific uh, from patient to patient basis depending on their comorbid conditions their age yeah. there may be other factors so one has to look at the patient in a more holistic way and then take a call during neutropenic sepsis yes i think across the world everybody uses it yeah i think the the mention in the ids also makes it that if a patient is hemodynamically unstable and the patient has a high risk of death the same uh, setup of this uh, you may consider yes its beneficial effects are always been under the controversy but uh, yes we we all agree for that ki if somebody is in a sick group we can always consider them Next. Nikhil sir do you have any exposure or any uh, experience with this pectil gristin which is a single dose yes we use we use quite often it is available again it was quite expensive now quite reasonable for the patient it's a single dose it comes in a 6 mg uh, i would say pfs and one shot is enough uh, it's a pegylated so it's a polyethylene glycol uh, filgrastim so it it can you know uh, have a kind of a sustained uh, dosing in the patient's blood stream and uh, otherwise we used to give every day one gcsf for the patient around 300 micrograms 
now we often both you no know, both both the gcsf uh, preparations we have different set of indications when the chemotherapies are coming more frequently like uh, every week then we probably go for weekly uh, or small dose or gcsf but when the treatments are coming once in three weeks like a breast cancer or uh, let's say any other where neutropenia is expected these are the patients who typically go on to receive pick filgrastim i had a small doubt anyway uh, most of the time what we use is filgrastim only not the pick filgrastim do you see like somebody sometime they uh, like start developing your neutrophil count very early within a two or three days of filgrastim also and when you give this long acting one like pick filgrastim it the action stays for how many days actually so typically it is expected to work for 2 to 3 weeks now try and understand the normal gcsf is around 300 micrograms and this is 6 mg so 6000 uh, micrograms right so it's 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 a uh, it's a uh, quite a big dose in 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 that term at that terms and typically most of the cycles also come once in 2 or once in 3 weeks time these are the times where these are recommended but you know when there is a acute uh, crisis like situation like a neutropenic sepsis we normally don't go for pig gcsf we go for more conventional gcsf and that is how we normally plan because what happens is sometimes the pig gcsf is given and the patient continues to remain neutropenic then becomes a challenge should we give more or should we not give more and that's a big issue so conventionally we still use gcsf the dose can be escalated from patient to patient especially in the hematological conditions up to 10 microgram per kg per day what is the ideal time to stop sir gccf <clears throat> so gccf normally one should be patient should be hemodynamically stable or uh, favorable for at least 24 to 48 hours time uh, neutrophil absolute neutrophil count the so called uh, uh, numbers tell us that more than 1000 for three consecutive days or a single number more than 10000 per cubic millimeter that is a good time to stop the gcsf so many a times when you cross this some basic numbers we do discharge the patient with one or two doses of gcsf which they can take at home thank you sir uh the last thing what we give mostly in this severe or uh, high risk patients having severe febrile neutropenia neutropenic sepsis will be granulocyte transfusion it seems logical but still it is underused or there is no significant randomized trial which has shown their beneficial effects indicated in bacterial fungal infection when they are not responding to the empiric or proper antibiotic and antifungal treatment for more than 48 hours usually the donors who are going to donate this granulocyte they are treated with gcsf 200 to 600 microgram plus dexamethasone to recruit more and more granulocytes into the circulation then they subjected to apheresis the granulocytes will be collected and they are irradiated before transfusion to the patients usually been given in patients having persistent and profound neutropenia and uh, we can stop granulocyte if your absolute neutrophil counts are more than 500 for 3 days so how frequently you sir actually in hematopoietic uh, this stem cell transplant and all those cases they use almost every day one granulocyte transfusion the basic problem what i believe with granulocyte is very short acting it stays in the blood for less than 24 hours you give in the morning by evening the platelets sorry the white blood cell counts again drops with the one give one granulocyte transfusion how much we are expecting the neutrophil count to increase so uh, quite important question uh, yet we do agree that this is a <clears throat> more of a desperate circumstance for the patient the typically granulocyte transfusion is is normally being given in the patient where you where we are struggling in terms of getting the neutrophil numbers right or going uh, in a uh, upward manner uh, when you look at the studies now somebody has tried somebody also has seen the positive side of it or you know some kind of positive outcomes but when we don't have good randomized studies we always look at meta analysis and when you look at the cochran meta analysis for uh, granulocyte transfusion uh, it has not shown a significant benefit having said that uh, uh, my colleague dr ganesh uh, he uses uh, quite uh, frequently for some patients and he has got some positive results and that cannot be negated because there are times when this gcsf or granulocyte transfusion has uh, shown to be uh, uh, quite uh, uh, useful in few patients so but when you look at the recommendations when you look at the bit of a data the data is quite iffy quite mixed and uh, uh, i perceive uh, since i don't treat much of hematological patients 
our use of GC, uh, granulocyte uh, transfer is very, very minimal. But, uh, you know, it's again, as I mentioned, it's a very desperate situation where whatever you are trying to do, you are just trying to do something for the patient uh, and see whether that really works or not. But if that's, this doesn't work, then it's very unlikely that anything else is going to work for the patient. In the take home, already we have discussed uh, when there is a fever and leukocytosis, may not be the common presentation when there is a neutro, uh, neutropenia. Unique challenges are they have non specific clinical presentations like altered sensorium, unexplained organ dysfunction. In this kind of patients with neutropenia, we should be very aggressive in evaluating and source control and to start appropriate antibiotic empirical as early as possible. Neutropenic sepsis has a narrow scope of error. So early, higher uh, and modalities when it comes to uh, let it be investigation or treatment helps the patient having a better outcome. These patients need to be dealt when it comes to neutropenic sepsis like in medical emergency. So with this, I'll uh, conclude my presentation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you, Dr. Misra, in actually bringing that uh, in a lucid manner, lucid manner. So, Dr. Nikhil, we actually uh, missed a discussion about a very aggressive uh, evaluation and investigation. Uh, that's what we actually uh, talk about when a patient is sick in an immunocompromised host. So, what is your take? One side, we are talking about uh, not even asking to do a, a parietal examination because uh, it can breach the mucus and uh, translocate. In the other side, we say if you have a focus somewhere, if you investigate aggressively, you have a better chance to pick up that organism and better chance of survival. Something like uh, you need a bron bronchial velar lavas, you need a sample from your lung. So uh, we, we do understand aggressive, amazing, maybe non-invasive, amazing like CT scans. Or as Misra said, you may probably sometimes need a molecular diagnostic in that say. Uh, so this all or to actually give you extra add-on thing other than your clinical acumen to guide your therapy, to probably narrow down your therapy. So what is your take on that? Uh, so if I understand your question correctly, uh, we have some invasive procedures on one side which can also guide us uh, in terms of... Uh, yeah, we avoid most of uh, the times... Uh, because we know a small breach in the mucosa can right. in right. so the other side we talk exactly. about aggressive. Yes. Yeah. So what happens is you now we do understand that we are always uh, trying to hunt a area of or source of infection. Now perianal pain or perineal some kind of uh, uneasiness for the patient one does consider as a one of the potential source of infection. At the same time, one should also be vigilant uh, from the fact that one cannot do certain investig certain uh, procedures on this patient. Because these patients, I have seen in in uh, uh, when you know I, when I was into my studies, we have seen these patients collapsing in like 20, less than 10 to 12 hours time. Uh, maybe whether it was a reason, cause or reason, we do not know. But these are certain recommendations also, so one should avoid that. At the same time, uh, I do agree that uh, it is very important to do all those uh, take help of all the imagings and what are possible sources of uh, information to try and identify the source of infection. Like uh, in, in, in fact, one of the guidelines, Dr. Mishra had mentioned about chest X-ray. Yet I must tell you that if the patient is actually symptomatic for some respiratory symptoms, the threshold to do a CT scan should be extremely low. Yes, agreed. Secondly, we talked a lot about neutropenic sepsis, but unfortunately we live in the era of viruses now. So a virus, I mean, a neutropenic patient can, can potentially develop a viral infection also. True. So one cannot, and now that everybody's, these days we are seeing a lot of these H3N2, I do not know the exact numbers, but influenza virus, I would say. We already had uh, our uh, uh, face off with COVID in the last couple of years. So these viruses also have made our lives quite challenging in terms of diagnosing the patients, whether it's a bacterial sepsis or just a viral infection compounded on just a plain neutropenia. So it's the, the intent should always be there to search for a focus. I totally agree with that. And as I mentioned, a good clinical examination is very important, except that one or two areas which I mentioned specifically, one can avoid once the count increases. Let's say the neutrophils start crossing 1,000. These are the good time to actually examine the patient, including the perianal examination. 
where the likelihood of patient uh, uh, doing badly comes down quite significantly. There were some questions to actually take. Um, the um, M four tericin B in empiric choice in neutropenic sepsis. Uh, if you are suspecting a fungal infection over your uh, echinocandins or oriconazole, any take that from? So we normally uh, don't use. We use, it's not that we have not used in the past, but with the current choices, better choices which are available, the posaconazole remains one of the very important choices for us both for patients who undergo transplant as well as patients who are on uh, AML, uh, MDS treatments. Uh, the reason being, uh, amphotericin big is a quite, uh, is a quite a challenging drug at times, especially with the, you know, uh, uh, I would say expectant sepsis where we also uh, have issues with the renal dysfunctions and all so on and so forth. So we always go for a choice which is now, uh, which is available, which is easy at the same time. Uh, which is also equally potent, I would say. So we have moved on from the amphotericin B prophylaxis to the more of an azole prophylaxis, more so with posaconazole. Again, not for solid tumors, but more for uh, leukemias and transplant. Yes. I think posaconazole has been on the front line for a prophylactic way to cover probably, as Misra said, both uh, your um, uh, maybe candidal infection, also for some amount of uh, the maybe filamentous uh, organisms covering them. But I think uh, what uh, uh, the point is is making is uh, probably amphotericin B to cover both uh, treatment therapy when I have in doubt whether it is a uh, candida, whether it is a, probably a, a filament in the form of aspergillosis or a mucor. In those situations, uh, probably an empiric choice alternative to uh, other two agents can be considered till you have a problem in diagnostic dilemma. So that yes. will be one area where uh, probably we can use. Yes. And if we, I have a confirmed case of mucormycosis, probably it will come as a first line therapy. Uh, add on to that, others all will come other for second or not. Yeah, Mr. Now, actually, amputation B, if you see the guidelines, mostly for the ESCO guideline and IDS, which were the older one, they have suggested posaconazol or amputation B as a uh, prophylactic when you suspect like lung is involved and aspergillus is a possibility. The only thing where I believe maybe empiric, the endemic empiric treatment, fungi. Empiric treatment, not prophylactic. Empiric. Sorry, empiric, empiric treatment. So I just having a like how frequently we see this endemic fungi like fusarium, cochidiomycosis and all in Indian scenario because in those cases amputation will be amputation B will be the only choice. See, I think in the same guideline which you are talking about, if the patient already received any of them, see, as you said, even Dr. Nikhil was talking about the patients receive fosaconazole as a prophylaxis. And these patients developed a septicemia, and you are talking about a fungal possibility. They document about not to follow the same azole group. Switch the uh, class or add the class. Uh, and these are the situations where probably considering an amphotericin or alternative therapy will uh, come into play. And coming to that uh, endemic fungi, uh, these are all rare phenomena, but these are not uh, extremely uh, not possible uh, like a phenomena. They are rare, but they're still uh, seen in a pocket of cases in even our situations. I think we had an interesting discussion. Any take-home points, Dr. Nikhil? I think uh, we had a uh, extensive lengthy interaction during the presentation itself. Uh, yes, I think this is quite an important topic. I'm sure uh, for especially for whether you talk about a critical uh, care field or you talk about physicians field, you talk about uh, pulmonologist field, oncologist, hematologist, I think we do come across these patients once in a while. And it is important to really sensitize ourselves that uh, there are certain recommendations. One has to follow some basic rules over here. Uh, many a times I have seen it happening. Sometimes we get a frantic call once in a while from emergency. Oh, there is a neutropenic patient. So as long as the guidelines are in place, as long as your algorithms are in place in your own setting, it happens. So one should also uh, kind of, you know, uh, try to sensitize other departments. This is very important. That it's not always that all neutropenic sepsis or all neutropenic infections are bad infections. Majority of the patients come out, uh, especially when you see, because otherwise, if the neutropenic, uh, I would say, deaths are so high, we almost should stop using chemotherapy altogether. Yeah. 
but yes we do come across uh, once in a while some complicated patient but in general when you follow the principles dr mishra mentioned that less than one hour less than 60 minutes the antibiotic should be in that is so important and there is always a good amount of discussion or dialogue which should happen to your patient try to make him or her understand that this is the only important complication what a doctor is looking at and as a patient you should also be vigilant many times it happens especially with the older patients where the patient may not throw a fever and these are the times when the patient gets sudden onset severe weakness we do tell them that in case you get profound diarrhea extreme weakness fatigue it, uh, despite not having fever please come to emergency True. so one emergency team need to be really sensitized activated properly your guidelines algorithm should be in place for your own department so that rather than uh, going back and forth taking calls this thing should be started more like an empirical manner so that eventually the patient should receive first dose of antibiotics and eventually the subsequent things will fall in place for the patient yeah that is very soothing uh, dr nikhil that you are reemphasizing that um, just because there is a neutropenia i don't need to be frightened good a good number of percentage of these patients do well very small fraction may land up into the sicker group but you need to be vigilant you need to be careful you need to be keep monitoring them dr mr there are questions related to a little away from dr nikhil uh, related to drug induced neutropenia we have seen methotrexate intoxication purely from okay, actually we have seen few management. cases basically methotrexate even azathioprine if uh, few people have taken daily methotrexate and came to us with severe profound and prolonged neutropenia actually the problem with these patients is like uh, as a neutropenia we need to start uh, maybe empiric antibiotics and all because their plate in their white blood cell counts are very very less zero one But nil zero nothing will be there and uh, they take very long time to uh, to improve when they when not start functioning we start to seen them responding to any gun anything response. actually most of the patient they we lose them actually they don't uh, improve only one case of azathioprine i don't know how frequently we see with azathioprine having so such a severe uh, neutropenia that is the only patient survived recently we had two or three cases of methotrexate they had uh, very poor outcome because their uh, white blood cell count never improved for eight days 10 days also and they land up in multiple infections so, yeah, so uh, they are the sicker group yeah let's make a quick point over here the methotrexate i mean especially we often come across some patients who are from a rheumatology outcome yes clinic, yes who come with the extremely low counts and yes. come with almost like a severe grade 3 mucositis fever sepsis and so on and so forth now always it's always a good idea to uh, if possible try to check methotrexate levels this is a quite important test uh, methotrexate rescue should be applied immediately which is in the form of not folic acid but the folinic acid so to overcome the folate trap you have to uh, rescue it with the folinic yes. acid so that is especially for the students and of course when you uh, and the rest of the management whatever we have discussed dr mishra had discussed same guideline should be applied about azathioprine it's slightly different drug it is more of a lymphopenic drug and these are the patients who more behave like uh, like you know rbd positive patients more so with the typical those hosters coming out all the all over or pcps so typically lymphopenic patients where though we get different set of infection even though they also would have neutropenia along with this and these are different challenges because you just have to wait and watch before the bone marrow escapes the but sometimes the bone marrow might get just ablated due to profound neutropenia to a profound uh, uh, drug doses yeah so thank you i think um, we had a wonderful session of a hour or so and there was a good number of participants who were glued uh, more than 150 to 200 attenders who came and participated Uh, uh i thank dr nikhil who is a seasoned speaker a very intellectual and uh, for his sharing of his wisdom his knowledge his composed clinical acumen along with the scientific evidence we thank you dr nikhil it was always yes, a privilege and honor to have you on board thank you for your participation and thank you being there for us for an hour or so and we should also thank dr mishra for his uh... I, will, i will i will i will i will go back to that so uh, thank you dr misra uh, for being there and um, uh, and getting this presentation in a quick time in a week time and bringing all those discussions and all your experience 
last maybe a couple of years or so in different parts of your oncology, both hemato-oncology and also uh, linked to your uh, solid organs with uh, Dr. Nikhil and all putting together. Thank you, both of you, for bringing this. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the slide. There were two busy slides. Actually, this is not my final presentation. Uh, by mistake, I have opened uh, the presentation which I prepared yesterday. So, no issues. I think you you made the interesting discussion. That's where yeah, well, these are not the. That is the reason most of the slides are very busy. Like we will have slides. many more sessions to come up. Thank you, both of you. I conclude the session.